All right, without further ado. Chris Ann Hall received her bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Blackburn College. And her Juris Doctor from the University of Florida. She served in the U.S. Army as a military intelligence cryptologic linguist. She was a prosecutor for the state of Florida for nearly a decade. Chris Ann also worked with a prominent national First Amendment law firm where she traveled the country defending Americans whose rights were violated by unlawful arrests and prosecutions. She has written six books on American history and the U.S. Constitution. Chris Ann is a regular consultant on numerous radio, podcasts, and television programs. Without further ado, Chris Ann Hall! for being a part of this with us. And I just wanna express my personal thanks to the church for allowing us to come. Maybe you don't experience this like we do, maybe you don't uh, see this the way that we do, but when we travel around the country, there are churches who refuse to allow us to use their facilities to teach. They believe that the Constitution is too political, as a young man uh, was pretty much brought up in church, there was this unspoken or even sometimes spoken rule that religion and politics don't mix. And that for some strange reason, Christians should not be involved in politics. And uh, even more so, you, you wouldn't dare speak out against the government or somehow resist or not do what they say. Christians have to be involved in politics. God commands it. The scripture supports that. I always heard it through Romans 13 presentation that we were basically taught enjoined us to slavish submission to government. Like you just submit no matter what. There was really no evaluation of what maybe the directive might be. One of the most powerful voices in America is being silenced by errant teaching from the pulpit. I thought it was easy to sort of sum up that Romans 13 says, don't be lawless. And that's the core teaching there. Don't be lawless. And then I notice as it's, as Paul is describing the believer's relationship with government. God speaks through him to actually define the role of government as well. What happens when they're not a minister for good? What happens when they're not punishing evil but promoting evil? What about when they're punishing good? What about when they're doing things outside of their defined role? If I follow them, when they step outside of their role, doesn't that make me lawless when they're being lawless? And if Romans 13 says, I'm not, I'm not to be lawless, then I violate that when I submit to lawless government. I started looking at the Old Testament and, and other stories in the New Testament and found all of these examples of people of God saying no to unrighteous government, to unlawful government, resisting. Romans 13 does not teach a slavish submission to government because if it did, then the Hebrew midwives in Exodus violated biblical principles. Daniel, by resisting government, violated principles. God himself recruiting Moses to resist the king, Pharaoh, we would have to have God violating the very principles that he allegedly laid down. So I, I don't believe the Bible entertains the notion of uninvolved people of God. There is no passive Christianity. Inevitably, what happens is this. 
one person will stand up and then everybody else will stand. Throughout history, the power of change rests in the actions of one person. Our entire independence movement began with a man named James Otis Jr. A man who stood up, who as a government employee quit his job because he could not participate in the government overreach, violating the rights of the people. I mean, this is a recurring theme about the power of one person. It is astounding. Every period in history that involves monumental change, good or bad, has always begun with one person taking a stand. Every turn of event through history hinged upon a single person. For good or for bad, it always came down to a single individual. One man reaching out to others to educate, to inspire, to ignite them into action. If it had not been for James Otis Jr., one man standing up and saying, no more. Not only will I not participate, I will not comply. And I will teach others the power of noncompliance. As a right of the people, the power of one to reach many, to unite under the banner of liberty, to the securing of the rights of every individual today, tomorrow, and for posterity. It is human nature to look for a leader. It is human nature to stay where you're comfortable. We can't wait for uh, what is the group going to do when we get a hundred people, when we get a, when we get a thousand people together, boy, then we can do something. But sometimes through a course of events, through a long train of usurpations, we have to become uncomfortable. Change will not happen without movement. And when we've been sedentary, when we've been comfortable for a very long time, movement is uncomfortable. We have been training our generations in the wrong information about government. We have been training them to be submissive and compliant to authority. We have forgotten that we the people are the rulers over government and we have allowed government to be the rulers over people. If we truly want that to change, we have to stop looking for leaders and start being them. I believe you're here today with us. You have sacrificed this period of your time today because you believe that America is worth fighting for. I believe that you're here today because you recognize on this level that it's going to take a certain amount of sacrifice. Unanimously, the groups that I speak to all believe, all know that our governments are out of control. Right, left, liberal, conservative. But everywhere I go, what do you think the most asked question I get is? How do we fix this? We have activist judges. We have governors that act more like monarchs than representatives of the people. We have sheriffs who blindly enforce law. We have county commissioners and city councilmen and state legislators that simply ignore the people and trample the rights of their constituents. We have a Congress that seems more concerned about politics and special interests than the liberties of the people. How do we fix this? If we had been teaching history properly for the last hundred years, if we had been teaching the Constitution properly for the last hundred years, we wouldn't have that question. We wouldn't be where we are today, mind you. But we wouldn't have that question because we'd know exactly what to do. I started reading the Constitution itself and what it means. And I thought to myself, we weren't taught this in law school. We don't teach this 
in grade school. We don't teach this in high school. We don't teach this in college. These are things that anybody can get on their cell phone. They can read this, they can know this. Why is this information being hidden from us? Why aren't we being taught? And I wanna teach you to equip you so you can know the truth about limited government power. To inspire you, to ignite you, to be the leader your spirit is calling you to be. Now history is our guide. Patrick Henry said, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided and that's the lamp of experience. I know no way to judge the future but by the past. Experience is the oracle of truth and where its responses are unequivocal, they ought to be held to be sacred and conclusive. Einstein said it a different way. He said, if you do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, that's the definition of insanity. It's time for us to stop doing the same thing. And I mean, it's time for us to stop showing up at the ballot box and thinking that when we hit that little dot, pull that little lever, punch that little screen, that we're making some kind of magic happen that that three minutes, once every two years, if you're diligent, once every four years, if you're not, and if you'll admit the majority of the people you know never even looked at the ballot before they showed up. William Pitt the Younger said in 1783, necessity is the plea for every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants and it is the creed of slaves. We don't have to invent or figure out how to fix this. History and our founders have already given us that information. America was built on the fundamental principles of the natural rights of man. Samuel Adams said, among the natural rights of the colonists are these, first life, second liberty, third property, together, Number four, with the right to support and defend them in the best manner they can. You, you have an individual right to secure your own life, your own liberty, your own property, because if you do not have that right, that inalienable right to secure yourself, your property, which is necessary to life. Your liberty, which is necessary to property and life. If you do not have an individual, unquestionable right to defend yourself, you are a slave. How many of you recognize nobody in the world has a duty to defend your life? because nobody in the world has the same interest you do to defend your life. It is a personal interest and a duty in the first law of nature. In that we must understand there's a hierarchy involved. We live in a day where we've been taught an inverted hierarchy. The hierarchy is God created man. Man created society. Society created government. Each step further down the hierarchy, you have less power. But how many of you see today that our, our proper flow of authority and government has been inverted. How many people do you know that think government is the highest power? Which means, by the way, we are beneath government. Which means 
We are subjects to rulers. Which means we didn't create them. They created us. I want us to think about these things because everything in history, everything in our foundational documents, everything that built America proves every single day that our governments, federal, state, and local are operating outside their created authority and engaging in massive overreach to the destruction of our rights. History also proves that more oppression means that the people in their spirit wake up because I believe we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. I believe that. I believe that every person created in the image of God has within them a spirit of liberty given to them by God that needs and yearns to live in liberty. Now see, we have forgotten that government has a single purpose. I mean, we remembered it long enough to write it down, but we don't read these things anymore and we don't study them. And it says that to secure these rights, what rights? The inalienable rights. Which inalienable rights? The ones given to us by the nature of our creation. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the politicians. Oh, did I read that wrong? From the consent of the president. Oh, I know what it says. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consensus of the Supreme Court. I want you to notice from the very beginning, we are the head of government. That if they are operating outside our consent, their power is not just and let me just put this out there for any of the politicians who will tell you because I had these conversations with them well you elected me so you consent to what I do uh no no your election to office is not a blind consent for me to be obedient in anything that you can think of and pass by a majority of your body. However, our silence and compliance becomes our consent. This is the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. I like to teach from this because it tells us what we created. When we created our states. Most people will read the Declaration of Independence, they read the introduction, then they get to the list and their eyes glaze over and they click to the next page. We miss this valuable information because we've trained people to have a 140 character or less attention span. The Declaration of Independence says, we therefore the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions due in the name and by the authority of the King. Is that what that says? Parliament. By the authority of whom? The people. By the authority of the people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. But what is a state? From this we understand in the negative that a state is not a colony, right? 
Because we were colonies, now we're declaring ourselves states. What's the difference? If you live in a colony, everything is done with permission from the central government. How many of you feel like maybe you might be living in a colony? Well, here's the good news. You don't live in a colony. You live in a state. Not just a state. A free and independent one. And that they, the free and independent states, are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the, what? State of Great Britain. You see what that word state means? That word state doesn't simply mean New York, New Hampshire, or Rhode Island. That word state means independent government. Your state is an independent, sovereign government just like Great Britain, France, or Spain. Somebody will say, well, but we joined the Union. Okay. That doesn't, that is not a surrendering of your sovereignty by joining a Union. You are in a Union, but you are still independent, sovereign bodies. You know what's amazing? Our states were created with greater sovereignty than any other country in the world because we were created under the principle that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Germany was created under the principle that kings give rights. Now this is not the end of our definition of the states. The Declaration of Independence continues and says that our political connection between the state of Great Britain is over, and it is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states. Let's rewind just a second. Who created the states? The people, right? By the authority of the people, the document says. To secure our rights is the singular purpose for the existence of any government. There is no other purpose in government than to secure our rights. Not our rights in the collective, our rights as an individual. Because you see, if we are focused on the rights of the collective, then there are no such thing as rights. They're privileges bestowed upon us by mob consent. And when, when, when mob consent can give something to us, what can they also do? Take it away. Take it away. The good people created our states with one purpose, to secure our rights, and here's the authority we gave them to do that with. Full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states like Great Britain, France, or Germany may of right do. We've got to move forward to the Constitution. What kind of document is our Constitution? The document of our Constitution is a legal document. It is a contract. It is a specific kind of contract that we call a compact. A compact is specifically different than a general contract because of who is involved in the agreement. A contract, generally speaking, is an agreement between two legally sovereign people. Now, when I say legally sovereign, I mean you've achieved the age of legal consent. Can your 15-year-old create a legally binding contract? No, because he's not sovereign in the eyes of government. He's still, sorry guys, subject to his parents, which I like to remind my 14-year-old. But a compact is not an agreement between legally sovereign people. It's an agreement between legally sovereign governments. Which means from legal language, the states are the parties to the compact. I'm gonna teach you a little bit of contract law here. The states are the parties to the compact. Now you're gonna get some pushback by your think tanks, pundits, and professors. So let me give you 
the answer to their question. They're going to say, well, what Chrisan really means is that the Constitution is an agreement between the people and the federal government. No, it's not. One simple fact proves that to be false. And I'll ask you, was the Constitution ratified by popular vote of the people? No. How was it ratified? By the states. Because the Constitution was not ratified by popular vote of the people, then the people are not a party to the contract. It was ratified by the states, which means the states are the parties to the contract. Now, what's amazing is we knew that back then, and Patrick Henry, one of many, was very unhappy about that. He said, how dare we start this document with we the people? We the people had nothing to do with this. It needs to read we the states. So the states are the parties to the compact. Now, you'll get another little pushback there, and they'll say, oh, well, what Chris really means is that the Constitution is an agreement between the states and the federal government. Because, you see, there are always people trying to put the states and the federal government on equal footing. That's not how that works. When you create something, you're not created on equal footing. The creator is always superior to its creation. that this Constitution is an agreement between the states and the federal government is a temporal impossibility. You see, the states ratified the Constitution that created the federal government. The federal government did not exist until the Constitution was ratified. So in legal terms, the federal government is the product of the contract. You cannot be a party to the contract if you are the product of the contract because you cannot sign the contract into legal being if you do not exist until it's signed. So when our states created the federal government, they created a limited federal government. Because you see, you cannot live in liberty in absolute governmental authority. More power in government, less liberty in the people. More liberty in the people, less power in the government. How did they create the limited government? They did so by specifically enumerating its power. If it's not listed in the Constitution specifically, it does not rest as an authority in the federal government. And then the states did the most important thing they could have ever done. They reserved all other power to themselves. Now, the natural question comes, what power went where? What power stayed where? Is there any power that's not delegated anywhere, sort of floating around in the ether waiting for somebody to grab it and use it? Because that's what the Supreme Court and the politicians want you to think. That, you know, there's certain powers that are just sort of floating around in the ether, and they have to develop and devise and divine some magic language to pull it in to federal authority, right? Like environmental protection, health care. This is James Madison. James Madison is very important in understanding our Constitution for many reasons. He wrote a document that we call Federalist 45. He says, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Notice he didn't just say few. They're few and defined because they are specifically enumerated. He says, those which are to remain in the state governments remain. Remain. Why? Because they started there in 1776. And when the states created the federal government, they delegated a portion of their power to do a job for them. He says, the powers which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. He says, the former will be exercised principally on 
external objects, foreign affairs, war, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce. How do we get to a point where our federal government can actually tell its people that we have plenary powers? Do you know what that word plenary means? Unlimited. And we buy that. Because we don't teach what the word delegate means. That word delegate means a temporary trust of responsibility or authority by a higher power to a lower power. There are two very important aspects to delegation. One is that it's temporary. Two is that it's from a higher power to a lower power. We have just discovered and learned, not through my interpretation, but reading the documents themselves, that the states are the higher power and the federal government is the lower power. And the power that the states delegated to the federal government is temporary. Temporary because it's conditional. And what's the one single purpose for creating government? To secure our rights. That's the condition. The purpose of the power we've delegated to you is to secure our rights. When you fail to secure our rights, it's our authority to take that power back and do it ourselves. Now, from a federal and state perspective, which power then reserved to the states? Madison says the powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which in the ordinary course of affairs concerns the lives, the liberties, the properties of the people, the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. Do you see that little magic three-letter word in there? All. You see, if it's not delegated, it's reserved. If it's not specifically listed in the Constitution as an authority of the federal government, it is reserved to the states. So what about the CDC, the EPA, the FDA, and the Bureau of Land Management? By the way, BLM is Bureau of Land Management in our context. What about the Department of Education, Health and Human Services, USDA, ATF? What about the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Interior, Department of Ag, FAA, FCC, SEC, and any of these other things you can, three letters you can string together? All of these powers are reserved to the states. How do we get a federal government that is actually exercising power that is not only not delegated, but reserved to the states. Because our states comply. Now there are very reason, various reasons why they comply. Most of it extortion. Now remember, I'm not here giving you my opinions. We are here to work through this. The Bible says, let us reason together. I'm showing you the documents. We're going to walk through the reason together. Because I don't want anybody to walk out that door and say, Chris Ann Hall said. Wipe that from your memory banks. That is not an acceptable phrase. Because I am not here to say. I am here to teach. Reserve means to exercise dominion over a thing to the exclusion of all others. The power reserved to the states is ownership by the states, right? We know that word reserved means ownership. That means the states own that power, which means the states have the right to say no. Can France step into your state and tell you how to run your state? No, because... The power is reserved. Let's say you live in Utah. Can Texas come in and tell you how to run your state? No, because that power is reserved to you as a state. And what we need to understand in this relationship of power being reserved, 
The federal government is just as much of a foreign power as France or Texas within your state. But if the power is not reserved, if your state does not have the right to say no, then you must accept certain consequences. These consequences cannot be denied if your states do not have the authority to say no to France, to Texas, or the federal government. That means if it's not reserved, it's open to anyone. If it's not reserved, then you must admit there is no limit to federal power, that the Constitution is actually a farce, and that the federal government can exercise whatever power it wants, and the states must simply comply. If the power is not reserved, and the states must simply do whatever the federal government tells them to do, then you must admit that the states are not sovereign. And if the states are not sovereign, they're like your 15-year-old. They can't make a legally binding contract, which means the Constitution itself is null and void, which means our federal government exists of its own authority with unlimited power, which means we do not live in a constitutional republic. We live in an absolute monarchy or an oligarchy with unlimited power to dictate to the people. But here's the good news. Our states are sovereign and independent. The Constitution is still a legally binding contract. And the federal government is still legally limited in its authority. And the only thing that has to change is this. Because we've been taught the wrong things for a long time. Studying this, understanding this, was kind of mind-blowing to me. Three years of law school, nobody taught me this. Do you know that our law schools don't actually teach the Constitution anymore? What they teach is constitutional law, which sells us, lawyers and judges, and eventually the people, that judges and lawyers know more about the Constitution than the men who wrote it. That it's irrelevant because it was written so long ago. And it can't possibly have meaning today. See, the Constitution is not a statute book that says you can't drive more, more, faster than 75 on the interstate. It is a contract of timeless principles that create and define government, period, for a singular purpose. What is that? To secure our rights. Do you know what's ironic? The Constitution is a contract. Your pundits and think tanks and professors will call it the contract theory or the compact theory. Interesting, when the people who actually wrote it call it a compact, I don't know how you can call that a theory. The Constitution is the only contract in America where lawyers and judges refuse to apply contract law. You see, I had the honor to debate a law professor at the University of Miami. And the Federalist Society brought us in, brought me in, to talk about how to interpret the Constitution. Using contract law, there is only one way to apply the Constitution. This is not the opportunity for think tanks and judges and lawyers and Supreme Court justices to make it up as they go along. Contract law says you must first go back to something we call the meeting of the minds. The meeting of the minds is where the parties to the contract sat down and told us what the contract was supposed to do, how it's supposed to work. But this modern application 
of interpretation of the Constitution, brainwashing the people into believing that the Constitution is not a standard, that it has no meaning, and after all, it's a living, breathing document, is contrary to contract law. And so I brought this up at this debate because the law professor was trying to teach us how the Constitution has no meaning, it's written too old, long ago, the people are dead, we can't possibly know what they meant, which is another lie, by the way, because they wrote reams and reams and reams about what they meant. But you see, I asked a singular question. I said, okay, if the Constitution, which is a contract, is a living, breathing document, would it be okay for us to sit down with my colleague here, the law professor, and the dean of the law school and go over her contract? See, what if the dean looked at the law professor and said, we realize what we meant when we sat down and created your employment contract, but after all, it's a living, breathing document. It doesn't really mean what we meant when we wrote it. It means what we want it to mean today. How do you think that law professor would like her employment contract to be viewed as a living, breathing document? Now that was the point in the presentation where the dean of the law school went like this. <laughs> but you see, we just simply have to apply some thoughts and some information and education that we've been denied. This is how it works. The states are inferior to the people. They are their creator. They are superior to the federal government in reserved powers. If we just simply taught that, things would be so different today. It's a check and balance on power that rests in the hands of the people. check that power. Now let me remind you once again, we are talking about a separation of power between the state and the federal government, but we're not really talking about that, are we? We're talking about principles. The principle of proper governance. Now I love analogies. So let me do it this way. We are going to pretend in my analogy that I have just stolen Ben's car. Okay? Okay. And while we're pretending, it's a Maserati. How's that? Okay. I've just stolen Ben's Maserati. Now, do I have the authority to drive Ben's Maserati? No. Do I have the authority to sell Ben's Maserati? If I sell Ben's Maserati, is it a legally binding sale? No. Because the power over that Maserati was never legally delegated to me. That means I have no authority legally over that vehicle. And any act I conduct with that Maserati is null and void. Does Ben have to sue me to get his Maserati back? No. He simply has to take the title deed, which is the legal delegation of power over dominion of that property to the local officials, your sheriff possibly, and then the sheriff has to return it to him as the legal owner. When government uses power that is not delegated, it is stealing that power. These are not just simply unconstitutional acts. They are criminal acts because the Constitution is called what? The supreme law of the land. When the federal government is exercising power not been delegated to it, it is violating the supreme law of the land. When you violate the law, what are you called? A criminal. I, look, I understand that this is unsettling and this is uncomfortable. But you have to understand it is the government breaking the law, not us. Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. It says so in the Constitution itself. Article 6, Clause 2. 
The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Now notice it says the Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, are the supreme law of the land. Notice it does not say every law created by Congress is the supreme law of the land. Do you see that? There is a condition. Because if it's not made according to the Constitution, then the Constitution cannot be the supreme law of the land. Because you see, the Constitution is supreme without any condition, right? This Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. But the laws made by Congress are only the supreme law of the land when they are made consistent with the Constitution. Now think about this. If a law can be made that's inconsistent to the Constitution, how can the Constitution be a supreme law? It can't. You create a paradox, a contradiction. The laws of the United States, which are made in pursuance thereof, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Now what happens if we grammatically insert some negatives there? Laws of the United States which are not made in pursuance to the Constitution, are not the supreme law of the land, which means the judges in every state shall not be bound thereby. What this constitutional document is telling us is that laws created by Congress, executive orders created by a president, opinions created by the Supreme Court that are not made consistent with the Constitution are not binding on the states. James Madison says, in the case of deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted, the states have the right to interpose. Why do the states have the right to step up and tell the federal government no? Because they are the creators of the federal government. They are the creators of the Constitution. They know what they created. They know when the federal government is operating outside of its creation. But notice he says they not only have a right, but they are duty bound. How many of you realize, will admit that a, a, a duty is greater than a right? A right is something you passively have, but a duty implies obligation to act, doesn't it? Why are we duty bound? Because the states created the federal government and we created the states. And the only reason government exists is to what? Secure the rights of the people. And when the federal government is operating outside of its constitutional boundaries, your rights are not secure. So how do we interpose? See, that word interpose means to eclipse. And it's the state's authority, the state's right, and their duty to step up and say to the federal government, no, you cannot exercise that power in our state because it is not a power that we delegated to you. We must stand and say no to protect the rights of the people because that's the only reason that we exist. How do you interpose? The several states who formed the Constitution, see, I'm not making this up, being what? Sovereign and independent, have the unquestionable right to judge of infractions against the Constitution. Why? Because they created the Constitution. And that a nullification by those, what? Sovereignties of all unauthorized acts is the rightful remedy. What is Jefferson saying? The power of the state to check and balance unauthorized authority exercised by the government rests in our power to say no. And if we don't have the authority to say no, then we are not free. Remember, if they're made in pursuance to the Constitution, then, they're a, then, then they are the supreme law of the land. But if they are not, then we say no. Alexander Hamilton says this, there is no position which depends on clearer principles than that every act of a, what is that? Delegated authority, contrary to the tenor of the commission under which it's exercised, which is a long way of saying original intent. If you're not applying the Constitution the way we intended it, 
then your acts are null and void. You see, that's why original intent is the only legal, lawful way to actually apply the Constitution, because it's a contract, and that's what they told us. Look at what he says. No legislative act, therefore, contrary to the Constitution, can be valid. Say no. We are expecting the states to say no. Why? Because the states are separate and independent sovereigns. And sometimes they have to act like it. I'm sorry. I disagree. All the time you need to act like it. Your state governments are supposed to be the greatest opponent to the federal government, not their best friends, co-workers, and on the same payroll. You have to know your state constitution because that is the limit of your state and local authority. And your state constitutions are amazing. They actually do more to enumerate the security of your rights than the federal constitution does. Our state constitutions actually have specific language about the security of your inalienable rights that is not in the US Bill of Rights. But we have been brainwashed. We've been tricked. We've been beguiled. We move from one presidential election to the next. We never leave a presidential campaign. As soon as one's elected, we're starting to elect the next one. The same with your House of Representatives, the same with your Senator. We are constantly and perpetually in a federal election mind with a singular purpose, to distract you from this. Because this is where your power rests. Legally, do you have more power over your county commissioner or your U.S. House rep? Your county commissioner. If you do not, it's not a legal authority. It's an abdication of yours. Do you have more legal authority over your state senator or your U.S. senator? Do you have more authority over your governor or the president of the United States? Do you have more authority over your sheriff or the U.S. attorney general? You see, we have been distracted from where our real power lies. Your pursuit of happiness does not lie in who is elected president of the United States. Your pursuit of happiness, your natural rights and the security in them actually rests in who is your governor, who is your county commissioner, who is your sheriff. And because we've been distracted from this for so long, those who want the power have moved in, and you're seeing these state and local governments overtaken by Marxists, by socialists, by people who don't believe the Constitution as an ultimate authority in the security of your liberty. They don't even believe in your rights. Because we have been putting all our time and our money and our effort and our, and our resources in a federal black hole and ignoring where our power rests and our greatest protection rides. Because you see, we've just learned who is the higher power, the federal government or the states? The federal government can exercise no unconstitutional law unless your state allows them to do it. If you get control of your state and local government, you don't care what the federal government is doing because they will never be allowed to do it in your state unless it's consistent with the Constitution. All your state constitutions have a Bill of Rights, a Declaration of Rights, like the U.S. Bill of Rights, but declaring the rights of the people, not just simply the rights of the people, the inalienable rights of the people. All political power is inherent in the people. We created the states. That means all power begins with us. The state cannot exercise any greater power than we are lawfully allowed to exercise as an individual.
what obligation do you have to submit yourself to an authority asserted that has no legal authority? Just this one. Just the one that you rationalize in your mind. The only reason we submit to unlawful authority is number one, we've been trained to. Number two, we're too comfortable to do anything else. Or number three, we're afraid. But we need to understand the authority that we possess as the ultimate check and balance rests in peaceful non-compliance of unconstitutional acts. Null and void. We shall not comply. We must know that. We must believe that. We must enforce that. Samuel Adams said, he said, it's a serious consideration that should weigh heavy upon our hearts that ages and millions yet unborn will be the miserable sharers of our experience. When we comply with unlawful authority, we give that unlawful authority authority. We give it power not just over ourselves, but over future generations. We create a mental precedent that says, well, we've been doing that way forever, so it must be okay. Which means our children will grow up believing that this stolen authority is actual lawful authority. Remember I stole Ben's Maserati, right? Let's pretend that I knew when Ben and his wife were going on vacation. And I knew that they were going to the Bahamas for three weeks. The day they jumped on the plane, I stole his Maserati. I drove around for three weeks. Right? Everybody who saw me driving Ben's car assumed I had a legal authority to do so. Right? but I stole it. Do I have a legal authority? So Ben and his wife come back from vacation, all tan and relaxed and happy, and they notice the car is gone. And I've been driving it for three weeks. Does Ben have to say, oh, well, you know, it's been three weeks. I guess they own it now. No. What does Ben have the right to do? He has the right to take it back. You see, in law, we have these two things, assumed authority and legal authority. Assumed authority never becomes a legal authority without a transfer legally of authority. His absence, his negligence never transferred authority to me over that vehicle, which means he retains the right to say no. Does he have to sue me to get his car back if I've been driving it for three weeks? No. Ben having to sue me to get his car back because I've been driving it for three weeks is not only unnecessary, it's ridiculous, and it is dangerous. Now, we've been allowing government to assume authority over our lives for a very long time. Do we have to sue them to get it back? No. Suing the federal government to get out what legally belongs to us is not only unnecessary, it's ridiculous and dangerous. Why? Because suing the government to get back what already belongs to you is like Ben suing me to get his car back, showing up in court and finding out that the judge and the jury are all my family members. Right? So if the state is suing the federal government, where is the state suing the federal government? In federal courts, 
with judges that are appointed by the federal government. When the states sue the federal government to get their power back in federal court, what they're admitting is the federal government is the ultimate authority on its own limit of power. And when we sue the states to get our power back, what we are saying is our state constitutions are null and void, that they have no authority, and we're begging for what already belongs to us by creative right. That's why we must say we will not comply. Peaceful noncompliance is the most powerful tool. Peaceful noncompliance is the people enforcing the supreme law of the land when the government is acting unlawfully. The sheriff is your most important ally in the securing of your rights because your sheriff is not a hireling of the state, not a hireling of your county. Your sheriff is a constitutionally elected representative of the people. It is his duty by oath to secure your rights. It is not his duty to blindly enforce the law. If there is one office that you can take back control of to secure your rights, it's this one. Because your sheriff is the highest authority in your county. Your sheriff has an authority to deny enforcement of laws, state or federal or local, that do not secure your rights or work contrary to your rights. This is Sheriff Brad Rogers from Elkhart, Indiana. He stood up to the federal government. He got sick and tired of the federal government, the FDA and the USDA coming in and raiding his Amish farmers in the middle of the night trying to seize their weapons of mass destruction. You know, raw milk and cheese. He wrote a letter to the FDA and the USDA and told them that if they step foot in his county one more time without first coming to him and seeking his permission, that those agencies would have to come bail their, their agents out of jail because he was going to arrest them for trespass. And since the day of that letter, they have never had another problem with the USDA or the FDA because the federal government knows the sheriff is the highest authority in the county. That's why they're always trying to co-opt them. That's why your sheriff's departments are always being offered free toys and training and mutual jurisdiction agreements and ooh, we'll let you wear our badge if you let us wear yours. It's bribery, it's extortion, it's trickery for the sheriff to relinquish his authority to a lower power. Because you realize your elected representatives will do a lot of things when you're not looking, right? But they will never do what you want them to do. They will never do what you really need them to do. Not to provide you with welfare and homes and health care, but to provide you with the security, the ability to secure your own rights. They will never do that unless you expect it and you demand it. He says, some bloggers and natural food writers have hailed me as a hero. I'm no hero. I'm just doing my job. Remember, his job is not to blindly enforce the law. His job is to secure your rights. Whether you are a conservative or a liberal, I will be a guardian of the Constitution for you. I will not stand idly by while the rights of my county are trampled, whether by criminals or an overreaching government. And we have learned today an overreaching government is breaking the supreme law of the land, which makes them criminals. That is the power of your sheriff. And that ought to be the statement of every sheriff. And if it's not the statement of your sheriff, you need a new sheriff. If you don't have representatives who understand it's their duty to secure your rights and not violate them, then it's your authority 
to take that power back and defend your own lives, liberties, and property. Shelly Luther did. A defiant North Dallas salon owner says she's going to ignore a court order. She said, taking my business, taking my business without due process and just compensation is a violation of our Constitution. The Dallas salon owner who opened up her business Friday despite state and Dallas County shelter in place orders saying she couldn't. I just know that I have rights you have rights to feed your children and make income. For the governor to issue an order that says I cannot operate my business is a taking of my business by that government. It is unlawful, it is unconstitutional, it is null and void, and me and my staff, we will not comply. Yes. Luther tore up the citation. Not only is it a taking, it's a violation of the Texas Constitution. Perpetrated by the governor, by the county, and by the sheriff. Shelley Luther will spend the next week in jail and also has to pay a $7,000 fine. She exposed the violation of the rights of the people. Right now at 11, Governor Abbott takes action over what he calls a nonsensical decision to throw a Dallas salon owner in jail. People who did not connect those dots are now connecting those dots. And now you have a whole movement contacting the local government, contacting the governor. This has to stop. These are our rights. The whole community came together and created a fund to pay her legal fees. They came together to keep her open because she stood. Ian Smith and Frank Trimbetti. New Jersey business owners said, I'm sorry, but you don't own this. The State Board of Health has shut down the Attilus Gym of Belmar, but the owners disobey the order in dramatic fashion, kicking open its locked doors, as you see right there. This is our property, and our Constitution secures our right to secure and defend our property. The owners of Attila's Gym in Belmar, New Jersey have had their license revoked for repeatedly defying orders to remain closed. You cannot take this property without just compensation and without due process. And your taking of our property is not only unlawful, it is arbitrary and capricious because the guy next door who owns the Walmart, who owns the Costco, gets to have unlimited number of people in his business, but you're telling us we can't open it all. So we're taking back that power and we're keeping our business open. This morning, they were arrested. Why? For defying the state's mandatory shutdown orders. Here's an unconstitutional government arresting them. And here are they out of jail, kicking down the barriers and opening their business back up again. The power of four words. We will not comply. That in 2020, a pastor would be arrested in America for having church. arrested by a sheriff for having church. This pastor stood in a pulpit and said, government doesn't own my church. It's under the head of Christ and government cannot shut down my church. And this sheriff arrested him for it. This is Florida, by the way. I was a prosecutor in the state of Florida for nearly a decade. The law, pretended law, issued by the county, mind you, contrary to the Constitution of the state of Florida, on at least four counts, is a second-degree misdemeanor, punishable by $500 in fines or 60 days in the county jail. Now a Florida pastor is under arrest after refusing to stop holding large services. T.J. Holmes has... In my experience as a prosecutor in the state of Florida, I have never seen a sheriff dispatch helicopters, dispatch out-of-county deputies, and hold a press conference to announce the arrest of someone accused 
of violating a second degree misdemeanor. And yet this sheriff did all of that because it's political. It's not about your rights. It's not about your health. It's about politics. And this pastor said, I am not the subject of government. Government is the subject of me. And if you are violating the rights that have come to me by God, then you have null and voided your authority. Now you might be looking at me and saying, but Chris Ann, all these people went to jail. How is this to encourage us? Because if you don't go into it knowing what it's going to cost, you'll never have the courage to follow through. And if you don't know what it's worth, you'll never have the courage to stand to begin with. Life, fortune, sacred honor is what they pledged for us. Benjamin Franklin said, we'll hang separately or we'll hang together, but we'll surely hang. Whether that was metaphorically or literally, it still means the same thing. When the government can shut down your business, is that not hanging your family? When the government can impose unconstitutional uh, restrictions that violate the very core of your natural rights, is not that a metaphorical hanging of your rights? You see, we gotta understand, what is it worth? They're showing us what it was worth. Have we become too pacified in prosperity, too lazy in our luxury, too complacent and compliant in our comfort to realize that future generations are looking at a government that will be like Venezuela or Cuba or Russia? And that will fall on this generation. You see, it costs to have liberty, but it costs to maintain it. Can you imagine how different our civil rights movement would be today if we even had sheriffs back then that understood their duty? Miss Parks, this law that says you have to live and sit in the back of the bus is a violation of your rights. So here's what I'm gonna do. As someone who's taken an oath to secure your rights, you sit wherever you want on this bus and I will sit next to you and ensure the security of your life and your liberty and your property all the way home. Maybe we wouldn't have the race pimps that we have in politics today monetizing division and hate in America. So why do our constitutional officers believe that they have an obligation to blindly enforce a law and that that somehow will be excused? Samuel Adams said, no people will tamely surrender their liberties nor be easily subdued when knowledge is diffused and virtue is preserved. But on the contrary, when the people become universally ignorant and debauched in their manners, they will sink underneath their own weight without the aid of foreign invaders. You did not lose your business because of ISIS or people crossing the border from Mexico. America's economy, property ownership and liberty are in jeopardy because we are complying with un lawful authority. It's not a bad word. It's our duty. And it's our obligation. When government is tyrannical, the people of God have a duty to not follow and not comply how many of you have children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, kids you love, not even related to you? They can't defend their rights. 
Liberty is not a gift that you secure for yourself. It's an obligation to them. And the greatest power that we have is the power of peaceful non-compliance. How many of you know people who say, oh, it's too late, we're done? Well, it's not too late. We're not done. We have yet to have begun to fight. We have an authority. We have authority as the creators of government to control our creation, to set it back on the path of its singular purpose to secure our rights. We have an obligation to do that. We have an authority to do that. We have a, a way to do that peacefully. But we have a power to do that by the nature of our creation and from where our rights come. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain alienable rights. We have a power. We have an obligation. We have a posterity waiting for us to say, we will not comply so you will be free. And I just need to know who is willing to stand. stands, they're no longer alone. Abigail Adams, writing to my favorite founding mother, Mercy Otis Warren, said, the flame is kindled, and like lightning we watch as it spreads from soul to soul. We have an undisciplined government for decades. And they don't like it that we're now waking up. They don't like it that we're now demanding to be heard. And we've raised a spoiled brat representative government that needs to be taken to the woodshed. So don't think because it's not gonna happen in a day. Don't think because it might cost you a little bit and a little bit more that it's not worth it. We just have to ask ourselves, what do we want? What do we want our children to have? Are you satisfied with a government that owns you? Owns your business? Can tell you when and where you can leave your house? Under what conditions you can leave your house? Or do you want more? Because we have a chance to fight when our victory is sure. We have a chance to fight without bloodshed. But every time we comply, we establish a future where our children will not have that option. If you want to sustain the fight for liberty, this can't be what you do. It has to be who you are. Do you feel empowered by the truth that you've learned? Do you see now the duty that rests in every individual, not to secure the rights for yourself, but for future generations. Our founder said time and time again, we are doing this for ages and millions yet unborn. The end of the Declaration of Independence says we're pledging our lives, our fortune in our sacred honor, not for themselves, but actually for us. Thank you guys, God bless. So